It is good to reconnect invoking the Blessed Mary's aid for each one of us. If you please stand for this little prayer. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. You can be seated. My friends, Lent is time for spiritual fighting, spiritual battle. There is an inner battle. We have said something of that in the first part of this reflection. And now we will refer to the outer battle, which is a particular way of referring to the role of Catholic people in the world. In particular, there are some pressing issues of Catholicism in present-day America. And I'd like to make some clear reference to those points because, because I think very, very hard on young people. And I suppose one of the aspects of passing over our faith to the next generation is to let them know to be a Catholic entails to fight in the best possible sense of the world, to fight for something that is worth the fight. What's the outer battle? Probably the best way to approach the subject of this talk is to mention battlefields. What's going on? Statistics are really a matter of concern for Catholic people. Think of colleges and universities some statistics I read some months ago said that one-third of all women that go to college will have an abortion during those years of formation in college and university. Also, all the same, and this is very sad to say, all the same as their bodies are affected in such a horrible way, their minds, both for male and female, are affected. If you see the different aspects of society or areas of society, you can identify where, where, faith is lost more rapidly. Sadly, it is again in the centers of the study. Some kind of idolatry of science is taking the place of faith in many young minds. They come to university with some practice of their faith with some conviction about what they have learned, mainly in preparation for the sacraments, First Communion, Confirmation, in some cases, Sunday School of Faith in their parishes, 
But when they go to the university, when they go to college, very often, it is not all people, it is not all universities, but very often, as a societal phenomenon, very often, they lost their faith, their Catholic faith, their Christian faith in university. And one of the reasons is they have, they have not enough weaponry, if I use that word. They have not enough defense to fight against a pervading atmosphere that is repeating as a mantra, is repeating what is scientific is true, what is true is scientific. Science becomes the supreme judge in all things related to truth. So if science is not backing something, that means that it's not true. Or at least so the story goes. And many people come to believe that story. Let me put this very clearly, very clear. It is not science the enemy. As Christians, as people belonging to the Catholic Church, we know that science is a great treasure of humanity. It is one of the noblest activities of the human mind. And it is great to have the opportunity of approaching that the way of building up knowledge for all humanity. That's true. The fight is not fight against science. It is not against science. It is against what we could call scientificism. It is the idolatry of science. It is that way of thinking that makes of science the supreme judge of every truth. If something is true, that only can be decided going to the tribunal of science. It is not, it is not that science asks that kind of recognition. In fact, true scientists are usually very humble people and inasmuch as they know the limits of their own activity, they tend to be very reasonable and very humble, very sensible in what they affirm and in the limit of their own discourse as scientists. The problem is not in science. The problem is not in true scientists. The problem is in a sort of crust that grows off science and becomes a new dogma and becomes a sort of system of belief that is made up to fight against religion. There are historical reasons, we are not entering into that subject tonight, there are some historical reasons for that way of thinking of science and that way of thinking of scientific knowledge. The fact is that many teachers, many professors in college and in university keep repeating the mantra to young minds and as a result, many of them, when they finish their years in college, in university and postgraduate studies, they have lost their faith or at least they have lost the practice of their faith. This is very serious because if they have lost the practice of their faith, they are at the same time at that age in which they are deciding what to do with their own personal life. And that means life understood under the concept of affection, love, and the exercise of their sexuality. And that means that many of them will engage in relationships with no future at all. So failure 
is ready at hand and many of these will feel that there's no possibility of real commitment for the future. It happened, my friends, it happened during my lifetime here in America. When I was young, more than half of couples accepting marriage as, as their way of life would remain faithful to each other, will remain, will remain in that union, in that marriage. Some years ago, the tide went to the other direction and it is now less than half of all the number of marriages that have the possibility or the hope of staying together for the rest of their lives. This is a change that has happened in America in recent years. It, it wasn't that way, but it has happened right now. And we can see the relationship between these two factors. When it comes to taking the central decisions of your personal life, that's the time you need a very strong faith, a very powerful faith that is able to illuminate whatever you are doing and with what kind of heart are you doing what you are doing. So, if you are going through darkness during that period of your life and at the same time you are taking the central decisions of your life, you can imagine what is about to happen to family, what is about to happen to marriage. So, and that's just one of the battlefields. Colleges and universities. Science becomes an idol. Sex is seen as entertainment. Faith is a hindrance. And egotism is the standard. That's sad. And we, we can and we must ask ourselves, where are the Catholics? Where are they? What are they doing? Why are they hiding? And where are they hiding? Probably they are hiding behind the trees of the campus. They are not visible. Where are they? How is it? How is it that Catholics are not making any difference in this. If this brings some consolation to you, I can also say Jewish people are not making big difference on this. Protestants are not making great difference on this, on this. Which means that religion has no role whatsoever. People that are counted among the believers when they enter into college and people that have no faith at all lead in practical terms equivalent lives. Same entrance, same exit, same process, same results. So we can say and we'll We'll tell something about that in a few minutes' time. We can say that there are some degree of persecution against the church. If you are a committed Catholic, you know something about the HHS mandate and all the problem and the arguments between Cardinal Dolan and other senior officials of the Catholic Church and the federal government and that sort of tension and arguments and they are throwing things to each other. But even before we speak of the world persecuting us, we have to admit, we have to admit that this is a failure, the failure of not even recognizing that we should 
We should be doing something. We should be visible. This is a parish, a Catholic parish. We have, next door we have Catholic school. There are Catholic colleges. There are Catholic, Catholic everything. Where are they? Why, with a very, very few exceptions, why aren't they more visible? Wouldn't be wonderful. And I, I, I'm asking this especially for young people present tonight here. Wouldn't it be wonderful that people could say in that university, in that college, that there are so, so many Catholics that there's no possibility there's no possibility of getting rid of them or getting rid of their thought. They are present. They are making a difference. They have taken a clear stance and there's no way of getting rid of them. Where's the visibility of Catholics? That's a good question. Another battlefield the media, the media, wow. Even if you don't live in the States, I don't live in this country, I live in South America, I have the opportunity and I have the duty of going to different parts of the world, that's part of my mission. At this time in my life, I am invited to go to many different countries. I went to Canada last year, I have gone to many countries, especially in South America and Spain, but also at some point in Portugal, in Taiwan, in Ireland, in Great Britain. I regard that as a blessing. Well, let me tell you something. As far as I can tell, the media certainly, certainly are not allies when we speak of Christianism, of Catholicism. There are some exceptions, as in everything else, there are some exceptions. But as a general rule, what we have to say is that the media are clearly on the opposite side. Again, the question is, are there not anchors, you know, to read the news, or in the council or deciding what news will be presented in today's program, aren't there Catholics? Where are they? Where are they? Just two or three days ago, the Pope had a sort of last gathering with Roman clergy. This means hundreds and hundreds of priests filled in the Paul VI room where a general audience was held. And the Pope addressed this crowd, priests and deacons and some bishops. It is very interesting, you can go to the Vatican website and read the complete text of what the Pope said. And bear with me with a little parenthesis. You know what? During about an hour, about 60 minutes, the Pope spoke to the crowd without using a single paper. No paper just keeping his own reflection in a loud voice and telling them about what? About the Second Vatican Council and what followed after the Second Vatican Council. So it is admirable that this man of 86 years of age is still able to have a lecture with no aid, with no paper at all. He was speaking just from whatever he knows by heart. But my point is, coming back to our theme, that the Pope said to the clergy of Rome, 
that the Second Vatican Council was presented to the world through the eyes of the media. And the eyes of the media were trying to fabricate news as quick and as sensational as they were able to. Which means that they were trying to present the council in the light of just human interests and conflicts and fighting this cardinal against this cardinal, this wing against this wing, and this camp against this camp. That was the language of the media from the very beginning when speaking of the Second Vatican Council. And the Pope said, that way of presenting the council made a terrible, a horrible damage for the reception of the council in Catholic world because most people were receiving their own council, the Second Vatican Council, not through the eyes of the theologians, the bishops, the pastors, the advisors, that were present in the room, they were receiving what the media were reporting to them. And they were presenting the church in terms of fighting for power. And again and again, that version of fighting for power has remained visible and has remained meaningful for many Catholics. So that many people got accustomed to speak of the church just as an institution in which you have this cardinal against this cardinal and this camp against this camp. So we need true Catholic journalism to inform about the church's news and to inform and to present a Catholic vision, a balanced, I'm not asking for masking something about the church or masking something about what the world is doing. It is not about masking or making up. It's about balance. It's about presenting in a balanced way. We have to admit that Catholics in this area are very, very scarce, very scarce. There are some, there are some, but many, many of the journalists that are informing and keep informing the world about the Catholic things, about Catholic things, are not in any meaningful way connected to the heart of the message. And this is a serious issue. Again, I have to ask, where are the Catholics? Where are they? Why aren't there more Catholics informing? We don't know, but that's the point. Number three, we can mention this big M, this capital M, the M for market, the market. And by the word market, many things are meant. Market means relativism, subjectivism, consumerism, that's the market. And market with capital M is king. Let me give you some examples of this. Market means, for example, this difference that also happened during my lifetime. The idea I had, probably I was mistaken, but the idea I had when I was a child and when I was a young person was that a politician is a leader. And you know what it means to lead in the English language. That's the one that goes in front and ahead of the group and is showing the way and is telling the people what's best for them. That's the idea of leading and that's the idea of being a leader. 
And that was my idea of a politician. But at some point, politicians discovered something that is called social science. And social science means to fathom, to measure, to get results from the crowd. It is a very complex area of studies that brings you precious information about where people are and where are they going immediately and in a number of years' time. For example, where do people stand regarding this particular issue? Well, what people want at this point is this. And then you build up your political campaign according to the information of social science. In shorter terms, you tell people what they want to hear. You study the crowd, you learn what they wish, and then you present as your campaign what people wish. So if they say, we would like to have this, and that may be an X, we want X, wonderful. Now I have something to tell you, dear people. It is my program to offer you, guess what? X. Success is secure. Success is something you can count on because you are offering people what they already want. They will accept you, they will accept your proposal, they will vote for you, you'll get elected. It's good for the people because they will have what they want. It's good for you because you will get that precious place in the Congress or whatever place you like to be. What was lost in that process? What was lost? In that process, truth was lost. Truth was killed. In that process, what is good, what is right, was lost. Because in that process, if the politician asks his conscience or her conscience, if she asks her conscience what is right, she would interfere with the process. So the art, the very art, of being a politician in many parts of the world, and probably America is no exception, is no longer an exception, the, the real way of being a politician is having no conscience. Don't bother asking your conscience. You'll be losing your time, and there is a slim possibility that your conscience could interfere with the process of you getting elected. So please don't ask your conscience. Limit, limit yourself to just following the flow. And that is connected with the big M of market. Why? Because this is the market of opinions. What opinion is king nowadays? Well, nowadays, uh, some opinions are king. For example, let's widen, let's widen legislation about abortion. I have to come once and again about that. Let's widen legislation about gay marriage. Let's widen legislation about euthanasia. That's what people are asking for. Here we are ready to do what we have to do. 
And what we have to do is to accept whatever, whatever, whatever they propose we have to accept so that they accept us. We accept what they propose, they accept us, and they are happy, and we are happy. And if some institution, if some old and backwards institution named Christianism or Catholic Church is against us, there's a way to deal with that. What's the way? The way is using social science. So we ask people, hey people, do you think that Catholicism is really important? Do you think that Catholicism is meaningful nowadays? Do you think that Christianity or Christianism um, should be important for us? We are not that sure. We are, we are happy leading the lives we want to lead. We are happy the way we are. We have no problem with that. Okay, if you people think that faith, Christian faith, is no longer important, I am here to say to you, faith won't be important from now on. Effective tonight, faith no longer will be important. That was what you said to me. That is what I am repeating to you. This is what we could call the eco-politician. And just repeat what we are saying. That's called social science. Besides collecting opinion from people, besides that, they also, politicians I mean, have to pay attention to very powerful groups of power, very, very powerful lobbies. They are called lobbies. There are some people you don't want to mess with. Don't mess with some people. And you know what kind of people you cannot mess with in a country like this one. Don't mess with the really powerful ones, the ones that are in charge of um, insurance or transportation or health care or press. Don't mess with the press. Don't mess with them. They are really powerful, and they can, they have the power of transforming, becoming your life, hell, hell. If you didn't believe in hell, they will make you, they will make you believe in hell. They are able to, they can. So, that's the tight trope on which many of these politicians walk by. Okay, on the one hand, what ordinary folks think about particular issues, then pressure groups, and then telling the people that I am representing them. And that's the way I make a living. <laughs> that's the way I make my living. That's, that, that's what I do for a living. I live with that. So some people make shoes, other people tell jokes. The way I make a living is this one. So I repeat, I repeat what they want. And I know very well the pressure groups, I don't, I don't mess with. And that's it, that's the end of the story. It seems, in my eyes, it seems so perfectly logical and so sad. Do Catholics, do Catholics have something to do with that? Can we make a difference? Can we make a difference? Can we make something on that? Of course, menaces, menaces are serious, are serious. They know how to destroy someone. They know how to scrutinize down to the smallest detail a life so as to bring to public light some hidden secret at the right time to destroy the fame, to destroy the name of someone. 
But I ask, shouldn't we have some people, honest people, and by we, we I mean Catholics, shouldn't we have some people, some people, able to face that kind of difficulty? Shouldn't we have a few folks able to fight against this kind of challenge, to resist the temptation? We should, but so far there are not many of them. Another battlefield? Well, you have to ask about keeping track on your own leaders. And your own leaders are also in the church, in the church. This is also a big challenge. I have said so many things about politicians that some could think that I am just trying to defend the church. We all have to admit the church needs conversion. We need, as members of the church, and I mean priests and sisters and nuns and monks and bishops in the first place, we need conversion. We need that. But in order to make way forward in our own conversion, we need you, we need you people. We need your prayers, we need your presence, we need your friendship. We need your eyes not only judging us, but also taking care of us. One very, very regretful aspect of the church is, of course, the sins of the clergy. But before we point to that person and say, he has betrayed his vows, he has betrayed us, before that, we should ask, how much did we put in order to keep track of that person? To, to offer a hand so that that person could be rescued and could be kept in the mission he was called for. Let me finish today's reflection with a beautiful text from chapter 12 of the letter to the Romans. These are the verses 9 to 21 and in my mind this might be a beautiful way of finishing up, rounding up what we have said about the battles we are in. You know what's the purpose of all this? It is to recognize that our faith puts us before a huge challenge that is at the same time interior and exterior. We are invited to enter into the inner battle of conversion and in the outer battle of bearing testimony of Christ in the world. The New International Version of the Bible has this subtitle for the text I am about to read, Love in Action. These are the words of Apostle St. Paul, and I wish they make for a closure of our talk tonight. Love in action. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. 
Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Dear friends, thank you for coming along. If you see the opportunity of inviting someone else for their other two days we have, tomorrow at 7 p.m. here in the church, and then Wednesday at 7 p.m. again here in the church, do that, please. That's a way of shading the light you are receiving. I invite you to receive the blessing. The Lord be with you. May, the, may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.